Sometimes one of the scariest tests in the forensic science world are the more, quote, routine ones, end quote, such as blood ethanol analysis testing. There's such high demands in terms of throughput and such little real training in analytical chemistry in performing the assay given to these analysts that the potential for error is rather high. There's also the chance of, quote, over-reporting, end quote. And what I mean by that is taking the data and presenting the result as free from false positive and or free from any error whatsoever. Also, in the current modern performance of blood alcohol content testing in America, insufficient basic forensic safeguards are being employed. There are no national standards that we can point to that are universally implemented based upon true efforts to validate the method employed. This leads to a wide-scale and systemic lack of true validation in the performance of the analysis for ETOH determination. In our sister blog, www.padyblog.com, we have covered this and other potential problems in ETOH analysis in blood in some detail. You can check out that website to see what is available. Also on this blog, we have a lot of other concepts that touch on the analytical chemistry involved in ETOH testing as well. I encourage you to take a look at this blog and other uh, posts that have been placed with respect to it all. Today I present for your consideration a rather simple case not to retest blood alcohol results for blood alcohol content. I submit to you that it's a, at best it is a fool's errand and at worst a potentially dangerous method of incorrectly presuming trueness of the original reported result. Here's what happens in real life with blood alcohol content analysis. The laboratory at the government's request performs some form of testing, correctly or not, and it is reported out to the accused through his or her counsel. Oftentimes it's a simple one sentence testimonial assertion such as quote item 1.1 open parentheses gray tube top close parentheses was analyzed using headspace gas chromatography with flame ionization detector and was found to have contained within it 0 0.165 grams percent of alcohol period end quote. That's all we get. Infrequently there is data to support such a testimonial assertion. We get a single piece of paper, much like the one that's pictured on the blog site. Most criminal defense attorneys perform malpractice and simply accept that sentence as gospel truth. The few criminal defense attorneys that demand the data that the laboratory rests upon its decision to make such an absolute testimonial assertion rarely get the data despite discovery demands, motions, and subpoenas. They become frustrated they decide to send the second tube that is collected or the remaining aliquots of the first tube to another independent laboratory for reanalysis for blood alcohol content. As an aside, it is hoped for that prior to doing so, defense counsel has obtained a protective order, otherwise absent some statute, then the results of the retest might be discoverable or subject to a subpoena. I suggest that doing a retest for blood alcohol content is not best. This is for several reasons. First, as mentioned above and before, uh, any potential result in a retest absent some statute might be discoverable or subject to a subpoena. So therefore you're fighting two labs, one of which you invited in this particular case. And defending against two labs that are not related is very difficult, and especially if it's one that you thought was good enough to send the sample to. Second, any test that is performed is only as good as the sample. Even if the laboratory does the mythical perfect analysis, if the sample is not representative of the true conditions of the whole, then the reported result can never be correct. Put more simply, garbage in equals garbage out. That's a basic principle. It is the difference between endogenous, that which is the client's fault for having consumed alcohol and existed in the tube at the time of collection and is representative of the whole, versus exogenous, that which is from outside of the natural organic state, ETOH production. As a scientific skeptic, we should form the hypothesis that the sample itself is garbage and seek tests that can confirm or dispel the notion. In other words, falsification. The issue in blood alcohol of the GIGO or garbage in, garbage out issue ethanol in the sample due to putrefication of the blood. For a basic explanation, please see the www.padyblog.com post entitled 
what Pac-Man and the inflated and incorrect blood alcohol content results have in common. If you're going to do a retest, to get around this GIGO problem, it is best to perform one of the following four tests. First, one can have a DNA test performed on the sample. Obviously, the maximum that can be determined from such a test is that the contributor of the blood sample was or was not the accused. Second, one can perform a simple bacterial culture test to determine whether or not Candida albicans is present. Third, one can perform an ion test to see whether or not there's sufficient sodium fluoride is present and in what ratio if it is indeed present. Fourth, and I suggest that it is the best thing to do, is a simple and inexpensive blood glucose determination. If the blood glucose level is abnormally low and the accused presents with no medical history to explain the apparent hypoglycemia, then one can infer neoformation due to putrefaction. This, of course, would be an indirect test, but nevertheless a logical inference to be drawn from the data. This is especially so if you have other pharmacological data, such as a drinking history, that conflicts with the reported and expected result. Also, if you have someone who is prone to hypo or hyperglycemia, but that person's blood glucose level is not as high as would be expected, then again, we can infer neoformation of ethanol. It's just a better way to do it.